Defenders of Upper Rock Creek. Susan Hale, Georgetown Lake. Jim Christensen, Upper Fun Creek. Right family are on name. Linda Bach, Planner. Susan Swinley, I'm an attorney for the Montana Association of Counties, JP, funded by the JPIA. So I'm here under our land use contract with Montana Association of Counties. Okay. Cindy Ranch, my dad, and assistant. Okay. Uh, a couple of guidelines for the meeting. Um, we do need to follow a procedure that everyone will introduce yourself and say where you're from throughout the county or the area that you're from. And then after that, if you make any comments, at least say your first name again so we have it on record because we have to have plentiful records of who's saying what and where, why. And also board members, the same thing. Please say your first name when you are going to make a comment or if you have <clears throat> any comments at all or any questions. They'll know my voice. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And um, I think beyond that, do we want to, how do you want to proceed, Linda? Well, <clears throat> we have two, public, two written comments that came in, so I'm going to pass those out to each of you. Okay. Um, so each of you take a little stack. There's two mm -hmm. sheets there for each. Susan, you have I do. Okay. We're going to take a minute to read these, if that's all right. And these are the two comments that are represented in the staff report as public comment that was received. Okay. summarize kind of the points each of them made. The first one was from uh, Sarah Rhodes. It was an email dated July 30th, 2012. Her primary concern was that roads and right-of-ways, especially those located on her property or used to access her property, would be amended. Um, I responded to her via an email on, the, on August 2nd, uh, telling her that, you know, we cannot require um, improvements on other people's property. Email, and the second was an email dated August 1st, 2012 from Hal Seward, I think that's how you say that, um, owner of Lot 41. So he's an adjacent lot as well. He, has sev he had several concerns, including that the original covenants be transferred to both new lots, that no further division after this subdivision for these lots be done, no lot under 10 acres in size, and a minimum 100 foot setback. Um, all of those have been addressed and required in the findings and conditions that staff is proposing. He also questioned the variance and if this would apply only to this subdivision or for all of Aerostone. And he questioned whether this was a uh, precedent setting. He questioned if others could list, split their lots using this var variance and the short answer is no, he, uh, this is a site specific variance. So approval or a denial of the variance is based on these conditions for this subdivision. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so at this time, Linda, if you want to go over what our findings were and <coughs> a full review? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'll go so we through the findings. The meeting yet, or how do we... You open up the public hearing, okay. and then ask for the staff report, and then you get the applicant presentation, then you're going to get public comment, okay. give the applicant an opportunity to rebut any of the public mm -hmm. comment, um, right. the board can ask questions, right. um, and then you want to board discussion and make your findings and decisions. Okay, well at this time we'll go ahead and open up the public meeting for the um, subsequent minor subdivision of the uh, Aerostone uh, subdivision lot 40A. And we'll go ahead and have Linda run by the uh, overall background. Okay, so the, the proposal is to create two single family residential lots um, from 36 acres and it's from lot 40A, which was originally created under the Aerostone subdivision. Uh, the lots will be, are proposed to be 15 and 21 acres in size. So one will have a uh, review by DEQ, the one that's 15, and the one that's 21 acres in size will have local review through CHEP. Um, it's in an unzoned portion of Granite County. So there should not be any zoning issues per se. Um, the property doesn't have any improvements. Um, it's in this rural residential district that is Aerostone subdivision, which most of you know where that's at. Um, and we were all up on site earlier, so. Um, and as part of, and covenants were existing with that original subdivision. So some of the things that we usually look at and need to address, we're addressed under that first subdivision. Um, he's looking at individual wells and sewer system. He'll put in Northwestern Energy Power in Century Link. Is it Century Link now up there, Gordon? Uh, I, used to be Quest, but. Yeah, it would be Century Link. They're okay. taking over all. I don't believe there's phone service up there. Okay, we can note that. No phone service. Okay, so that's uh, the power is on site. That has to be extended to the lot. Um, the neighborhood comments we've gone through. The zoning is not there. Uh, as far as conformance with growth policy, the growth policy encourages development in already developed areas. So this would be in compliance with that. Um, it does uh, for. It encourages development in non-agricultural lands, which this also does. Um, and then, but however, this is, uh, not that this has anything really to do with the growth policy, but some of the amenities, as you'll know, such as telephone, are not there, so. Um, Impacts on ag, I did not note any impacts on ag or ag water facilities. Um, I think that the impacts that have occurred through Aerostone addressed both of those uh, issues and that this isn't going to have any kind of significant impact on ag or ag water. Um, it will not have an impact on municipal water and sewer systems since it is um, fair distance from Phillipsburg, which is the closest municipal system. It should actually have a positive impact on schools, um, assuming that the development was to increase uh, local school enrollment by potentially five children, which is the statistic you use for figuring out how many potential kids you'd have with the subdivision. So that was a positive impact. We did receive a signature from the superintendent, and that's it. Parks are not required, um, even though this is a subsequent minor. Since he's only creating one lot with it, it's not required to have the park lane. Police protection um, will be the same that is in other general areas within Arrowstone. Um, we did, or we are asking for a specific covenant to be placed on this subdivision, which will note that it's in a very remote subdivision. Access time could be long and delayed due to the location of the subdivision and current weather or other unknown conditions, and that all services 
including police protection within this area are limited at times and may be unavailable due to weather or conditions or other conditions. Uh, no comments were received from the Sheriff's Office. Fire protection. This is considered to be high fire risk. Um, and so it follows the requirements of 6R, which we don't use as often as 6Q, which is the normal one we do. Uh, with 6R, you are required to do a hazard mitigation plan. Um, that plan needs to analyze existing hazards. It needs to map areas to be cleared, map areas to be thinned, uh, identify that roads and driveways are sufficient for emergency vehicle access and fire suppression activities. The property also, according to those standards, must have at least two entrances exits for residents. Um, the private roads within Arrowstone do exit um, onto the county and state roads in two different areas. Uh, however, this cul-de-sac, this subdivision is located at the end of a very lengthy cul-de-sac, as you all saw, um, and DNRC did note that, that it is at the end of a, a long dead end. Um, but it, DNRC did know also that it appears the roads would be accessible by DNRC vehicles during the normal wildfire season. Um, and then there's a notation that roads may not be accessible to regular fire department equipment year-round. Um, staff is requesting that building site locations be placed on each of the properties um, and that those identify slopes of 25% or greater and those would be in buildable areas. Uh, the Aerostone in general, it has been working with uh, the Flint Valley Fire Service area to annex in. Um, that's one of the requirements that we're asking for is the annexation um, into a fire district. We don't know, know which fire district, we're just saying a fire district. And the property already has a 100-foot setback from property lines within the existing covenants, but we do require that as well. Refuse disposal was primarily addressed under um, the original subdivision, so all we're asking for here is uh, our standard sanitate or uh, recycling language. Medical services are the same as Police services, we're requiring the notation again that at times um, all services, including ambulance services uh, within the area are limited and at times are unavailable. Um, we received a signature from the Granite County Medical Center and uh, that was the extent of the comments we received from them. Uh, water quality in the area. Um, you'll see the water information that's contained within your packet. Uh, the neighboring well has a well that is 1,135 feet according to the state records and it pumps three gallons per minute. Um, the state requirements, um, and of course as you know DEQ will, will review this for the 15 acre one, the 21 acre one will be reviewed by Chad but um, they require a cistern to be put in if you cannot get four gallons for a minimum of four hours is their, their requirement. Um, Stormwater. Uh, Who requires that? That's a requirement of DEQ. So stormwater. Uh, well, it's a requirement. <laughs> so you can't really do much about D what DEQ requires. That we're just noting that it's, it's there. Stormwater drainage analysis was completed um, by the applicants. Uh, you'll see Gordon Sorensen's calculations in there. Um, no road work is proposed for the subdivision. Uh, limited stormwater information was submitted, obviously, because no road work was planned. Uh, we are asking, though, that roads and culvert um, cross drainage have, that have been previously installed need to be upkept. Um, and any new driveways have to have a culvert in, which is a requirement. Um, sewage disposal will again be reviewed by DEQ, but both san sanitation system sites look fine. <clears throat> uh, geology and soils. Um, 
Gordon noted a, a smaller, uh, noted that there was a rock outcropping on the property. The original subdivision had a hand-drawn area uh, that showed a rock outcropping. It was not clear where that information came from, but it was noted in the original subdivision. Um, so that's just a matter of notation that a rock outcropping does exist there. Um, so the limitation on the roads is somewhat due to that, <coughs> that rock, rock outcropping. For vegetation, um, the property does not appear to be harboring noxious weeds. And we are just asking for the standard weed management plan that we ask for for all subdivisions. Uh, wildlife and wildlife habitat were both addressed under the original subdivision. We don't think that there's any uh, need for additional requirements for wildlife and wildlife habitat. Utilities, you saw on site that there was power. It is overhead as part of that original subdivision. Overhead power was allowed to be uh, brought in to lots 40 and 41. Staff is, uh, believes that due to, the, due to that rock outcropping, it's reasonable to say that the new additional lot will also require overhead power, which is a, var a variation to some degree from what we usually require. Um, natural hazards are there from fire and topography primarily. It is a steep forested area. Um, there are clearly potentials for forest fires. Um, current covenants on the property limit tree removal, and if you remember, well, John went but because he wasn't, um, he didn't see it at the time we did, but I noted up there that that's uh, actually a change that I need to make. A uh, separate covenant went in later that uh, took that out and allowed them to do uh, tree removal for both aesthetics and thinning purposes. I was up there yesterday. Yeah. The, uh, Cindy told us that you had gone up. But I had said that up there. So. Oh, I see. Thank you. Um, DNRC will provide wildland protection in the area. Um, but again, he did note that it was a one-way dead-end road. Um, he recommended the property be developed in compliance with fire protection guidelines. Staff is recommending um, all trees with the beetle kill be removed. Um, and additionally, a covenant be placed on uh, the homeowners that they will comply with the clearing of around the homes in compliance with that wildfire protection guideline. Uh, to minimize wildfire spread to homes up there. Who um, requires that? Linda? Uh, well, right now, nobody requires oh, yeah. That's part of one of the conditions. But DNRC recommended that they clear around the homes. But right now, that's just a condition. So it can be taken off, amended, added to by the Planning Board Thank you. Commission. Thank you. Okay, road access. Um, the property is accessed off of Trapper Ridge Road. Um, it's a private road. It was created for Aerostone subdivision. At the time that road was created, it does have low traffic volume. Um, at the time that the Aerostone went through, the requirement was for a 40-foot easement, 18-foot driving surface, which is why you see the road showing up on flats with a 40-foot easement and a narrower driving surface on the ground. Um, at the time the subdivision was completed, the planning board actually raised some concerns to the commission that they thought um, all portions of the road were not in compliance with the grade. Um, but the commission reviewed it and determined it was um, apparent that it appeared to be in compliance. And on October 10th of 2001, uh, Richard Skaggs, who was the road supervisor for Grant County, uh, submitted a letter to the um, Board of Commissioners saying that he found the road to be in compliance, uh, to be accepted and approved as built. Um, and the Granite County Commissioners accepted the findings of Mr. Skaggs on October 16, 2001. And um, the, actually the plat had been filed by that point and they released his bond. So. The roads for the subdivision are <clears throat> private roads. 
uh, and they are 40 foot right of ways. The county currently uh, requires a 60 foot right of way and staff's recommending that the road right of ways for Arrowstone subdivision roads located on 40A be widened to 60 feet. So we're, we cannot ask for anybody else within the subdivision to give up land, but we're asking for the portions that are on his property to be widened out to 60 feet. The developer has requested a variance which would allow him to not do any road work within the subdivision. His justification is the roads are in as good or better condition than when they were originally installed. Uh, the HOA for Arrowstone subdivision continues to do road upgrades and work. Um, the developer has stated the additional splits were contemplated at the time of the original subdivision and the roads were built to accommodate additional traffic. That's his justification for his variance request. Um, a fatal accident occurred on this road. Um, the vehicle was traveling westbound on Trapper Ridge Road in the general vicinity of the north side of Lot 34. Weather conditions had caused the road to ice over. Speed of the vehicle for the conditions was a factor, and the vehicle was unable to negotiate a turn, resulting in a rollover. An individual was thrown from the vehicle and received fatal injuries. The question that the board has to answer is whether the inherent design of the road caused the accident. That's the only concern that we're looking at for that portion of the road. And just as a notation, as you all saw when you went up there, they have put jersey barriers um, and concrete blocking there to try to limit any additional accidents on that corner. Um, a portion of Trapper Ridge Road appears to have been widened and upgraded from the beginning of Trapper Ridge Road to an approximate point uh, located on the north side of Lot 34. All other access roads which would be used for the subdivision um, to access have been upgraded. Now when I'm saying upgraded, I mean that the Homeowners Association is taking care of them and they've added uh, gravel onto them. Um, and it's not that shale gravel. For those of you that were here for the original subdivision, it used this shale gravel that just was not very good gravel. Um, so portions of the road have definitely been upgraded with a better quality of gravel. And then again, those concrete barriers are on that corner to prevent future accidents. Um, aspects of the road, even in the upgraded areas, may still be out of current county road compliance. And I think, um, as you all know, that the county road standard right now is 24 feet wide. So there's very few areas where it may even widen out that far. Okay, ultimately it is the goal of all parties involved that the road be brought to the highest standard possible to ensure public health and safety. Staff is recommending that should you grant the variance, um, that some road work at least be required. Um, I believe portions of Trapper Ridge Road which are located on 40A should be upgraded. The road should be widened to the current county road standard Road base and subgrade should be rebuilt to meet county standards where needed as identified by the developer's engineer. So we're going to let the developer's engineer go up and do an assessment of where the road base has actually deteriorated and in those areas we're asking for a rebuild, not a rebuild on all of the road. The finished gravel should be redone in accordance to current Granite County road standards. So we're asking for a better quality of gravel to be put on, on his portions of the road. Exactly. Linda is that on the just right so you'll know on your yep. map that there's a portion that goes on to yep. 32 yep. that's not included there's a portion that goes on to 41 that's not included we're just talking so it would be kind of an odd piecemeal of road but um, at least you're starting to upgrade the roads to some degree the finished gravel should be done um, Ditches should be reestablished again where it's needed as identified by the developer's engineer. So we're going to let him determine whether or not um, the ditching is not good, uh, sufficient for stormwater up there. Cul de sacs located on 40A should be upgraded to the current standard. And um, additional, I have additional cul de sacs shall be added to ensure cul de sacs are available every half a mile. 
and that's not starting from the beginning of the road, but that's actually starting from the end of the road and working backwards. And I think he already meets that standard. The developer has proposed a signage plan to post appropriate speed limits for the road and area. Um, I believe, Gordon, that goes all the way down to Scalpahoe Road, down. correct? I took it all the way down, yes. Okay. Um, that would help mitigate concerns about existing portions of the roads and steep grades, which uh, would not be upgraded. Um, the developer has indicated Aerostone HOA is active in upgrading portions of the road. Um, I do know that that is accurate. I know that, it, that the HOA has been active in upgrading and, and staying on top of their roads. Um, we can't actually require the HOA to upgrade anything as part of this subdivision, so uh, we're not putting any restrictions on the HOA at all. Um, and then we're asking for a covenant from this developer that says that should this uh, should this area, the, air, the original Aerostone subdivision is what we're talking about, so should the original Aerostone go uh, come forward for a road improvement district, we're asking that the people on 40A be um, constrained to not be able to protest that. So um, they would not, they're essentially giving away their right to protest a special improvement district as part of being able to subdivide without meeting all current standards. Um, that is pretty much the extent. They are asking for one road variance, and I've already gone through that. Um, there are four portions that you need to ask uh, to consider on that variance, and they are essentially, will it not be detrimental to public health, safety, or general welfare, or injurious to other adjoining properties? You need to decide whether it's based on unique properties to that, unique features to that property, um, and whether or not the particular physical surrounding shape or topography of this parcel would re result in, a, uh, in a, an undue hardship um, if the strict letter of the law was required. And then you also need to address whether it would affect zoning or growth policy. That is the requirements. I think I've gone through all the conditions. Um, so I will not go through those again unless you guys want me to specifically go through them all again. Well, I think what we need to do too is to let everybody in the public know that all the board members did attend. John went yesterday, uh, so we went in several different vehicles and we need to basically have a discussion of any other comments that were made in other vehicles that other board members didn't hear other people in the other vehicle. Tom, you made a couple of comments. I don't know if anybody in your vehicle made any comments, but we should share all those with all the board members at this time so everybody knows what everybody else is talking about. So Tom, if you want to just mention a couple of things that you said to people that were in our car. Sure. Um, I have some experience at Aerostone. I know some of the people up there. I've worked with some of the people up there. One of the things I was telling uh, these folks, or excuse me, the folks in our car is that I know Mr. and Mrs. Heath because they um, employed me to try and sell their parcel um, approximately a year, year and a half, two years ago. And it was taken off the market when they started to entertain the idea of splitting their lot. So I do have some familiarity with them and their plans here. Um, likewise, um, I mean, I've been in the subdivision a lot and uh, I, think it's, I think it's one of the better subdivisions we have. Um, I applaud what the homeowners are doing. They're trying to do improve the gravel where they can. Linda mentioned that before. Um, it's nice to see that we have an active homeowners association there, and they're making strides. Be nice if the coffers were deeper, but we all want the coffers to be deeper. And I think I mentioned in our discussion too that I thought the road was in a very good uh, condition overall. Was or was it? It was. There's a couple of bumpy spots and. I feel that it is one of the better roads for where it's located and the terrain that it's in, that it's a, a very well-maintained road. And wintertime travel might be something different, but right for now, I felt the road was very safe and usable. 
And again, if you put posted speed limit signs and people adhere to them, it could be a safe road. I kind of felt that the road was definitely narrow in spots that, um, I mean, significantly so. Did and anybody get out and measure it? No, we were in the, it's a one lane road, but I'm, my comment is when the snows come and the snowfalls go, you are, it's very um, deceiving as how steep those, those one lane <coughs> points are. So to me, the roads were very narrow and that was concerning on my, for, for me. I think the one comment that came, this is Susan told me, and the one comment that came in our, <laughs> it's okay, we'll get in the habit. The one comment that came in <coughs> our car while we were driving up and then coming back is that there are two, two spots on the subdivision road that are within lot 40 that are visibly more narrow and I believe when we got out we had the discussion it was a period that it was probably drainage um, and so that was noted by our car that these two spots they're not up where they're not near the turnouts and they're not up where we, near the top where, it, where we were looking at the driveways they were further down on the I'll call them on the down slope side of the lot and, then, and that they were visible. So we noted that and discussed the fact that there was a, probably a drainage issue that had narrowed the, the road width was probably the same, but the, the northerly embankment is significantly mm -hmm. narrow. There. And I think that was noted by everybody. Mm -hmm. 16 feet. And your name is? Peter Pan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> From from the edge of the rock, there's a couple spots, and I, I'm John Spade, by the way. And but from the edge of the rock to the very, very edge of the of the dirt where I wouldn't drive my truck, it was 16 and a half maybe, and you'd be hitting rocks on this side, so you'd have to, one would have to pull and stop. Right. Mm -hmm. And there was more than one spot. There was, and one of them wasn't on where I stopped and measured wasn't on this piece of property, but one of it was. Was that in that drainage where it had looked like it was a road of the way? You know? Part? It was actually between uh, lot 32 and the first uh, winding area that comes after that. <coughs> so, Mr. Chairman, I would ask that when the board is listening to the testimony of the applicant and the public, um, that you again, because you've been asked to grant a variance on the road, which is obviously one of those issues that, that's going to be an important issue for you to make findings on, you go back and you consider your subdivision standards for variances because you have to, you can grant the variance if you find the variance is not detrimental to the public health, safety, or general welfare, or not injurious to other adjoining properties, that um, the conditions on which the variance is based are unique to the property, um, which the variance is being sought and are not applicable generally to the other to other property, that the particular physical surrounding shape or topography are unique to this um, property, and that it's not was not a self-imposed hardship. The owner didn't create the hardship of the topography or the issue, um, and that the results in distinguishing by a mere inconvenience if a specific letter of the regulation were to be enforced. And if um, the variance will in any manner um, affect the provision of zoning, which is inapplicable, or the growth policy. I also want to remind you that your zoning regulations allow you to condition the granting of a variance. Mm -hmm. And if you don't grant the variance, then by default, what you've told this developer is for the subdivision road that's on his property, he has to improve it, he has to record a 60 foot easement and improve it to a 24 foot surface for all the portions of the subdivision road on this property. And just as a notation, if the variance is not approved for some reason, the result is that the, uh, the access road from the point it leaves the county road or state highway in this case, um, would need to be improved to the current county road standard from that point to his property line. Right. If we did not grant the variance, it would require the access road from like leaving the county road to the start of this subdivision to be brought up to the county standard? Right, to, right through, not only to the edge of this, but all the way to the, where that second lot 
is going to access. I don't understand what triggers that requirement of the rest of the subdivision to bring it up to a county state. It wouldn't require the rest of the subdivision, just this subdivision. Okay. So, yeah, I don't want to make it sound like the Aerostone HOA would have to do that. It would be Well, I guess I just meant, I thought we debated that previously about, about what's within a subdivision and what's not. Sort of like we did at Jericho Bay. <clears throat> Paving that portion, but not mm -hmm. leaving up to, okay. All right. Things are different okay. now. So, with that, I think applicant presentation and... Right. Okay. All right, so at this time, we'll turn it over to Gordon Sorensen. My name is Gordon Sorensen. I'm a professional engineer and land surveyor representing Matt and Karen Heath here this evening. Uh, I was not around when the original plat was filed. I was around, but not on this project. Uh, but the re I'm going to talk mainly just on two points, the road variance and the fire problem. And I'm going to ask about the fire problem first and direct this at Susan Swingley. Uh, it's not, this the subdivision is not contiguous to the Flint Valley service area, fire service area. It is contiguous to the boundary of the Georgetown fire service area. Uh, my question is, uh, can you annex to the Georgetown, and I know it's not practical to, to serve that area from the Georgetown area. It's more practical from the Peabird side. Could you do that and then get an interlocal agreement with the Flint Valley Fire District to serve it? And I'm not even talking about the whole subdivision here. I'm just talking about Lot 40A because it happens to be on the edge and is adjacent to the Georgetown Fire District boundary. Well, you know, that is a good question, and I have to say I think that if the board were to condition that, it might make it impracticable for your client to, I mean, yes, it's legally possible to do, but it puts your client in a difficult position to say, well, we're in Georgetown, but we, in order to get a final plot, we have to have a letter of an agreement or an interlocal agreement between the two districts for crossover service, which is why I thought when I looked at the condition, it seemed to me that it said you have to annex or contract for service. Did I dream that? I think it says you have to annex or, or some it other says suitable in 38. 38. It says you annex a property to a fire district or fire service area, create one, a fire district, or, or create a fire service area or district that could provide coverage. And I guess um, I would, they, both the fire service area and the fire district can actually contract for out of district service, which may be something that the board wants to consider is to require them to add an or contract for service because it seems to me it's more practical based on where the access road of the subdivision is to require them to get a contract with the district on this side rather than annex to Georgetown and then well the main thing I don't want to do is get them tied into some requirement of meeting some a condition with a fire service area that you could be years getting the thing negotiated and settled out I worked with other fire districts and those things can go like that or they can hang on for four or five years but I had them go both ways uh, so, uh, and, and the Heaths are interested in being in a fire protection area. Uh, you know, they believe that's the right thing to do. But just in case, and I didn't want to do this, but I did draft the variance for the fire protection, which I'm going to hand out. And I really would rather we didn't have to have a variance. I've got copies here to hand out to you. Uh, just in case, my purpose is not to get this thing tied up so you can't go to find a plant. But we're still waiting on somebody to do something to get a fire agreement made. And I, under do, I do understand that there is something in the works to put Aerostone in the Flint Valley Fire District. Uh, Chris Miller has been working on it. Thank you. And I talked to Sister Waldilly. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says that 
he's been working on it, although he hasn't been getting you know, things done like he would like to be able to tell me he was. So, and but anyway, I'm going to pass that out just, okay. yeah, just as a, I'm just trying to make sure we don't get trapped into something that can hold us up from going to final plat. His final plat's pretty 